Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Empowering BIPOC Voices in the Public Sector. My name is Lolene Bertel and I'm the Executive Director of the Johnson Triama Graduate School of Public Policy. I am very pleased to be co-moderating co today's session with Tanessa Boutin, Pute, pardon me, uh, IPAC Saskatchewan president, who I will introduce in a minute. JSGS and IPAC Saskatchewan are pleased to be co-hosting today's event, and I'd like to provide a bit of background on both organizations for those of you who are joining us for the first time. The Johnson Triama Graduate School of Public Policy, or JSGS, is a provincial center for advanced study and research in public policy administration. We are a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan that was based on the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that defines Saskatchewan. Since our inception in 2007, we have become one of Canada's leading policy schools for educating graduate students and public service servants interested in and devoted to advancing public value. IPAC is recognized as a leader at home and abroad in building strong and dynamic public sector organizations that excel in meeting the needs of Canadians. IPAC is dedicated to supporting those with a shared commitment to build excellence in public administration in Canada. IPAC brings together networks and shares best practices and experiences to help solve problems and position our members and partners for, for success in public service. They foster real conversations with people who are passionate about making change within the public service. For those of you who are new to the EDI discussion series, I am very pleased to welcome you today. This series focuses on engaging current and future public servants on issues pertaining to equity, diversity, and inclusion in the public sector. Yesterday marked the first anniversary of the death of George Floyd. His killing sparked global outrage and led to mass protests in the United States and here in Canada. It reminds us that we as a society must continue to condemn racism and be prepared to stand and work together to oppose racist and discriminatory actions. We need to listen, learn and work to be part of the change that is needed. Discussions like the one, the one we are having today remind us that we can and must do better individually and collectively to build and strengthen our communities. Governments in Canada have a pressing need to develop and implement sustainable and forward-thinking strategies and programs that support diversity and inclusivity in their hiring and promotions, actively combat against discrimination and harassment in the workplace, and provide employees with a sense of support, respect, and value. Before I turn the floor over to Tanessa, I would like to acknowledge that while today's event is taking place online, our physical homes are located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories and the traditional homeland of the Métis. We are glad to welcome all of you who are joining us today from across Turtle Island. Over to you, Tanessa. Thanks, Lolene. To help our event run smoothly, we ask that all attendees stay muted and turn off their video during the presentation portion of our event. Feel free to turn your videos back on for the Q&A though. The format for today's event is as follows. Our speakers will begin by sharing some of their experiences and lessons learned from their time in the public service. Following this, Lolene and I will pose some questions to our presenters. After that, we'll open up to the audience for question and answers. If you would like to ask a question, please use Zoom's chat function to send your question to Lolene Berdahl. She will read out your question. You can also feel free to submit them at any time during the event today. If you have any logistical questions during the event, please do not hesitate to send a message to Karen Jaster LaForge via Zoom's chat or email her at jsgs.events.uregina.ca. Please note that as with all our events, our public lectures, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the JSGS website at a later date. All right, now over to our speaker introductions. <clears throat> I am very pleased to introduce you today to our speakers, and I will do so in the order that they will be speaking. April Sora is an immigration, diversity and inclusion consultant with the City of Saskatoon. She has spent the better part of her career working and volunteering in the immigrant and refugee sector in both Toronto and Saskatoon. Having worked in many roles with both federal and municipal governments, 
April finds strength in her Japanese Canadian ancestry and familial history. Ashley McDonald is the Acting Director of Strategic Relations, Crowns and Agencies with the Ministry of SAS Builds and Procurement with the Government of Saskatchewan. Ashley has been an advocate for diversity and inclusion throughout her career and actively creates safe spaces for uncomfortable yet meaningful conversations. Raquel Passup is a Nakota woman from the Assiniboine First Nation known as Kega Kin. Raquel is the Regional Program Development Advisor and Post-Secondary Lead for Indigenous Services Canada. She has a keen interest in and focus on Indigenous policy, programs, and nation building. We are looking forward to an interesting and engaging discussion, and I am pleased to turn the floor over to our first presenter, April Sora. Thank you so much, Tanessa. Um, first, I'd like to thank both you and Loleen um, from the Johnson Chayama School of Public Policy and from yourself, IPAC Saskatchewan, for your work to put this equity, diversity, inclusion series together um, to make space for many voices to be heard. Um, it is an absolute pleasure and privilege to be here to share some thoughts and ideas with you today, as well as to learn from my fellow panelists, Ashley and Raquel. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with them and talk with them and, and just so pleased that we got to know each other. Um, I first like to say I'm not a policy expert, nor am I an anti-racist educator. Um, my area of expertise is community development, and I'm just here to share my world with you both past and present. Um, before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge the land that I am on, which is Treaty 6 territory and the wonderful homeland of the Métis, uh, as well as the land where I come from, which is Treaty 13 territory signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with the multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands in Ontario. I honestly can't imagine talking about anything that is meaningful without the context of whose land we are on. So um, given that this is Asian Heritage Month, I'm not sure that um, everyone is aware of that, um, but uh, given that and also being a time in our history when anti-Asian hate has been increasing all over the world, including here in Canada and Saskatoon, um, I wrote a poem that I'd like to share about my family, about racism, about racist policies that have changed the trajectory of our lives. The poem is called, I am the color of my skin. I am the color of my skin. Layers upon layers of history lay upon me, anger me, sadden me, comfort me. I am the dream of my grandparents, Years of oppression turned to privilege. I am my grandfather in the coal mines on stolen lands of Vancouver Island. Red, black, yellow, white, wages determined by the color of his skin. I am my powerful grandmother learning to cook roast beef and polish the silver for the white lumber mill owners who never saw past her beautiful Asian face and never understood her brilliant oriental mind. I am my uncle who built mighty boats that fished the waters of the same Pacific Ocean of ancestors in Wakayama that he never knew. Boats stolen and sold because of the color of his skin. I am my auntie who told our stories in pages of Japanese Canadian newspapers, morphing languages from east to west, code switching to be the bridge, only to be silenced because of the color of her skin. I am the 22,000 Japanese Canadians rounded up like cattle made to live in animal stalls, exhibition grounds, Vancouver, British Columbia. Babies, children, Bachan and Jichan, men separated from families, sent to road camps. No one knew where because of the color of their skin. I am my father, forced east with family, not allowed in. No place for the enemy alien, the yellow peril. Biding time, picking fruit in orchards where everyone has the same color of his skin. I am my mother 
from Powell Street to Greenwood to Toronto, interned by racist policy when young, interned by disease of dementia when old. Shogun lineage, warrior woman walking beside me, layer upon layer of history lay upon me, strength, passion, love, humility. I am the dream of my mother, oppression turned to privilege because of the color of our skin. This poem was written about my family and the families of 22,000 other Japanese Canadians who were sent to internment camps in DC during World War II. Everything was taken away from them, including homes, furniture, boats, clothing, everything except two suitcases. All of this was carried out by the Canadian government and it was the racist policies of the day that allowed it to happen. So I ask myself, have we come a long way from that time? I like to think so. Would we incarcerate innocent people again because of the color of their skin? We don't think we would, but we absolutely did after 9-11. And of course, we continue to do this all the time to indigenous people as a result of the inequities in our systems over hundreds of years and stolen lands. So how do we get better, we ask ourselves, um, in the world of public service and in the world of public policy. Um, and so I'd like to sort of bring this from the big P racist policy of the War Measures Act, which led to the internment of my family, um, to policy at the community level with some of the work that I'm doing now. I think this scenario, um, I. I found this very difficult actually to sort of target in on, but I picked one scenario, um, first of all, because I think it's a good reflection of the more global need for anti-racist thinking and being and doing, and also because it's something very timely and it's something we're all sort of in the midst of right now. At the moment, of course, we are in the midst of a pandemic and we have to get as many vaccines into as many arms as possible, as fast as possible. Um, the main way of doing that in Saskatoon here up till recently has been the drive through at Prairie Land and also working with the Saskatoon Tribal Council at the SaskTel Centre, uh, the two main vaccine clinics here. And so um, I, and I've been working with them very closely lately. Um, and I just wanna say um, kudos to everybody in healthcare and in the healthcare system, as well as at the city who have been working so hard um, throughout this pandemic. I am so grateful um, for everyone that's been doing that. Um, so we also know um, from our perspective that there are many people for many reasons who cannot get to a drive-through clinic or make an appointment to go, uh, nor take their children there for many reasons, such as maybe they don't have a car or they don't have access to a phone to make an appointment. There might be language barriers. There might be misinformation, lack of information, no information. Um, many people have work schedules that don't allow for them to take time off or they can't afford the loss of pay if they do take time off. And so, you know, and a lot of it too is based in poverty, poverty, poverty. So what can we do if community can't come to the vaccine, we need to take the vaccine to community. So um, now they're going out to pharmacies and doctor's offices, um, which is amazing. Again, I just can't imagine the amount of work that takes, but then how do we get into communities? So thinking community development and health equity, here's how we've been doing it. And we've just been doing this actually this past week and even today. So. <coughs> pardon me, sorry, SHA, the Saskatoon Health Authority calls the city. The city calls up a few community, community leaders that we know and we say, hey, do you think it would be helpful to have a clinic in your community? Where do you think would be a good place? Who do you think should we should work with? When would be a good time to hold a clinic? The community leaders have one meeting together, one meeting with the SHA and city and boom, our clinic is ready to go. It's incredible. The work is just incredible in the community. So for those of you who are working in an inclusive, equitable, anti-racist way, you're probably asking yourself, um, so well, why did the SHA have to come to the city to do this? What are the costs to our community as a whole if we don't invest in these small ways upstream? And also, and one of the most important things in terms of small p policy is do the community leaders get paid to do this work? Um, so here are some of my global learnings from this project. 
Um, and I'm just thinking, and again, I, I just want to emphasize that I am learning in all of this as well. Public service, um, like the Saskatoon Health Authority and, um, or health, health, yeah, health authority and, and the city need to hire people from communities. Um, we should be reaching. So for example, black, indigenous people of color, the LGBTQ2S uh, community, persons with disabilities, we have the connections the understanding, the expertise, the education, the knowledge, and many of us have those critical connections to community and lived experience. Um, that's one thing. So secondly, hire us at decision-making levels where we have the ability to make change, not just one of us, don't just hire one of us, try to reach beyond that employment equity goal and pat your, and before you pat yourself on the back. <coughs> Sorry, hire many of us, um, more than your goal, goal beyond on your goal. Um, when people say I, we reached our goal, I don't think that means you have to stop. So you don't have to be afraid to continue to hire. Um, it's very difficult to be alone in a workplace and try to trying to push those goals for those goals. Uh, also, if you're not going to hire hire us, then please pay for our expertise. Again, that's that small p policy that I think we all need to be um, try to be aware of, um, whether it's at the university or at the health authority or the city of Saskatoon, we're trying to implement these types of policies so that we are able to compensate people. And in a lot of cases, people who don't have um, a lot of money. So I guess what I'm saying, my message very quickly, is to change the racist policies that guide all our systems, our governments, our universities, our large corporations. And to close, I would just like to mention that amongst those 22,000 Japanese Canadians interned was Thomas Kunito Shoyama, better known to many as Tommy Shoyama, the namesake of this school, the Johnson Shoyama School of Public Policy. He's a role model for me. He was interned through an enactment of racist policies because of the color of his skin. And now he has a policy school named after him. This is something that I can strive for. So thank you so much um, for listening. And I thank you all so much for taking the time to be here today to, to give us this space um, to say a few words. Thank you. Awesome, thanks April. Ashley, over to you. April, that was so beautiful. And I'm, I'm, I get so emotional. So um, you, I'm glad that it was, a pretty, it was a nice segue to let me regain not crying and I can deliver my uh, introduction, but uh, thank you so much for that. That was beautiful. Um, so in recognition of the opening statement from Lolene, the fact that we now acknowledge that we are on traditional Treaty 4 lands demonstrates that we are beginning to verbally publicly and openly acknowledge diversity in our landscapes. And that acknowledgement of diversity is beginning to filter into our workplace culture, hence why we are here today. Uh, as Tanessa introduced, my name is Ashley McDonald and I'm a proud public servant uh, for the past 13 years. I wanna thank, just like April, um, Johnson Shoyama and the Institute of Public Administration of Canada for providing April, Raquel and myself the honor and the opportunity to speak about diversity, inclusion, equity, collaboration, and growth as a community with everyone on the call today. As an informal and formal member of various diversity groups over the years, I've had the opportunity to speak with people across the province about the beautiful outcomes we can achieve professionally, personally, socially, and as a province if we listen, learn, and work with each other. I also wanna preface the discussion today that in no way are April, Raquel and I, um, although we've been giving this amazing platform to share our opinions, thoughts, experience, um, but we are all unique individuals. Our thoughts may differ from each other and they may differ amongst uh, you folks in the audience. We do not represent the voice of all Asian, indigenous or people of color, but the opportunity to share our individual perspectives really demonstrates the commitment to moving the discussion of diversity and inclusion from a checklist item to intentional, meaningful focus on how to ensure diverse representation is included in business planning and policy decision-making settings. 
The conversation today is an example of how we can continue to hold each other accountable, be honest, and build upon the foundation to, just, to discuss openly and respectfully on a topic that sometimes can be un an uncomfortable conversation. We would love today to be open, informal, engaging, and a chance to learn from each other, answer questions, and discuss the importance of infusing diverse consideration into every decision, program, behavior, hiring opportunity, and organizational setting. I've had a lot of really great experiences. I've had awkward experiences, and I have had poor experiences. I've had a lot of people provide me amazing opportunities that have set me forth on a path of success, but I have also witnessed, observed, and maybe even reluctantly participating, participating um, in not abiding by my own guiding principles of being authentic and transparent and speaking up when the conversation was uncomfortable, a racist joke was made, or a comment about someone's body odor. I'm here today to have a conversation without blame, without judgment, and without anger. The conversation today is about being forthcoming of where we, where we fall short, but also celebrating the growth and pushing that momentum of growth forward. I hope that with April and Raquel and my, our vulnerability today, our stories and our journeys will spark a change or a light or a different thought that you may have not had before. Silence and surface level conversations and not speaking the truth and not being vocal when you see acts of injustice personally, professionally, online, out shopping, at your kid's school, will not change the landscape. As members of this community, as public servants, as students, as people responsible for shaping the future of this province, conversations like this are necessary. Difficult, yes, but necessary. So we just wanna thank you for taking the time to embrace the uncomfortableness you look within yourself and organization to make sure that you're doing everything within your purview to be welcoming, understanding, curious, and an advocate for change. And then with that too, I just I just wanted to close, like Brene Brown is a, a big inspiration for me. So I wanted to close with just one of her um, quotes uh, about being uncomfortable and having these conversations. And it's, as you think about your own path, daring to, daring to leadership, remember Joseph Campbell's wisdom. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Own the fear, find the cave, and write a new ending for yourself, for the people that you're meant to serve and support for your culture. Choose courage over comfort, choose whole hearts over armor, and choose the great adventure of being brave and afraid at the exact same time. And that's what, uh, that's what I feel like we are here today. So thank you. Amazing, thanks, Ash. Uh, Raquel, you're up next. Uh, Yoda Iake Moshte, Nimakoda, Mitakia B Chega Ken, Michejene Raquel Passa. Hina Maya Mitakona Yu Nana Dagu Gaga Ka. Awaya Mitakona Hina Maya Uyawana Dagu Gaga. So good afternoon everyone. Um I just want to thank you for inviting me for today's event. I want to thank Tanessa and um, I'm sorry if I, if I look up, you guys are above my camera. So uh, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to, to take a glance at you. So I just want to acknowledge um, my ancestors in the traditional lands of Tree Four territory. Um, and I just wanted to share that I also asked um, Nani Tanga, the great spirit to watch over us today and to guide myself and all um, my relations here, Ashley in April, uh, during this event so that we can start this in a good way and then we can feel safe, um, feel in a safe place during um, during this time and speak from our, our uh, kade, our hearts. So my name is Raquel Passa and I am a member from Care of the Kettle First Nation. Um, as an indigenous woman, um, I do, I, what I want to do today is start by sharing my story. Sorry, I just lost my mouse here. Uh, my roots, kind of my experience um, with, with this topic. And as Indigenous people, you know, we share our knowledge and experience, um, you know, those lessons that we learn from our loved ones, our elders and our ancestors. You know, I'm not, not a subject matter, matter expert on this, but uh, this is where I'm coming from, uh, and this is what I'm going to give you, share with you today. So, 
Um, you know, my loved ones always told me to be better, be better than them and be better for our people. So I grew up experiencing racism almost every day and even to this day. Um, I'm always an outsider, judged by the color of my skin, you know, stereotyped as that, as that, uh, that low life Indian. So I'm, I am visibly indigenous and I know that and I can, I see how I'm looked at, how I am treated. Um, you know, there's also a time that I observed that, you know, fair indigenous, a fair indigenous person, you know, always got the opportunities, you know, I was like, we observed that. So, and did you think, uh, think it ever made me not want to be a dark skinned indigenous person? I'm like, yeah, at times I wanted to be more fair so that my journey through life wouldn't be so hard, but I'm glad that it was hard because it actually made me a stronger person. And it made me discover my purpose to stand up for others and to make this world a better place. So I am uh, the first from my family to seek higher education. My family always uh, told me to get educated because our people need a educated leader in order to have a strong, strong voice in order to make changes in this world. You know, there's always opportunities to take, to take a specialized program we desire for Indigenous people, our students. Um, and uh, my family always encouraged me not to. Uh, they said, you know, I remember I was I was raised by by uh, my grandfather and my father. And, you know, I just always remember them say, you know, my girl, I'm like, you know, your identity, you know, your community and you know, your people, you know, they said, learn the mainstream colonial worldview. I'm like, learn how to challenge it and how to change it. I'm like, they said, stand up for younger generations and be better and make this world better for the next seven generations. You know, it was, challenging you know I struggled and I failed um you know but I kept holding up my head and, and persevering and at my age as indigenous person receiving a master's was the only way I got noticed um like I know it was because of how I was treated to make my to make my way in this world and as indigenous people we believe we are um on the path that we walk for for a purpose and you know everything we do we do with good intentions and for that reason our ancestors want us to be there uh, not for not only for our success own success but we humbly do everything for the next seven generations and we reflect every day on what we do and how we do uh, and what how do we need to be more accountable to create one world and a diverse and inclusive world a world without racism so I know I've, heard, I know you've heard all heard uh, walking in two worlds, indigenous world and non-indigenous world. So I used to believe that, but I also got tired along the way. I got tired of watching others be mistreated, of superiority or control, and I believe the ultimate goal to achieve is one world. And how do we do that? You know, we be accountable to relationships with everybody. In order to achieve diversity, we all need to be open about being accountable, and we need to to build those bridges with non-Indigenous people and we need to work together, you know. I do not see race, I do not see age, I do not see color, I see people. You know, my, my little girl also, I am a mother too, about eight year old. Um, my little girl was born this way, you know, our children, you know, they don't see, they don't, they don't see color, they don't see, um, they just see people. And, you know, and I wonder, and I'm like, why would we want to harm them, harm their purity? Um, by why would we want to bring them into a world and expose them to what what's hurting us, to what hurt us? And we need to be resilient and outspoken to make changes around us, at home, at work, and in public. Um, like reconciliation, diversity cannot be achieved if you want to control the conversation. You want diversity, then you need to tear down the institutions in place, tear down the enforcement, tear down everything in place that controls action. 
to find it with those that truly belong at those conversations and decision-making tables and like reconciliation, it needs to be by indigenous, by those right, by the people and by indigenous people and at the pace of indigenous peoples, you define it together, you stop controlling the conversation. Um, the future has gotta be more than words and just calls to action. I'm like the future is living it. And I think that's what I wanted to say today with my opening remarks. Thank you, Lena and Tanessa. Now my Well, thank you all. Um, I, I don't know about anyone else, but numerous times listening to the three of you, I, I got little goosebumps. Um, I found that incredibly powerful. So we are going to uh, switch into some, some questions. Um, I, I very much want to thank uh, April, Ashley, and Raquel for sharing your thoughts and your insights. And uh, Tanessa and I are going to, uh, to ask you to continue to do so. So Tanessa and I have some questions that we will be posing to our panelists. But for those of you in the audience, uh, if you have questions, we'd like to include those in the questions that we pose uh, to our panelists. So any questions that you might want to have uh, our panelists address, please uh, submit them to me, uh, Lolien Birdall. Just find my name in the Zoom chat function and send it directly to me and uh, I'll do my best to, uh, to include it in our, in our questions. So I'm going to start with the first question and then I'll throw it over to Tanessa for the second. Uh, but the first question goes to Ashley. Ashley, what, what, what does diversity, equity and inclusivity mean to you? I think that's a loaded question. I think that there's, um, again, I, I just want to repeat that my my perspective and my opinion may not be shared of my, it, it could be different from everybody. And I think that's the beauty of it. That's exactly it. That diversity and of different opinions, experiences to lay a foundation of how we move forward. Um, it means, I think, looking, I, I like how we say ec like equitable and not equality as well, because the tools, resources, support programs, opportunities um, is not a blanket that we have to, we can equally provide everybody the same layer of support and everybody is gonna be equally as successful. I think um, socially and professionally and how people grew up and where they came from, all of that, all of that matters. Um, so to me, what does it mean? It just means that representation at the political and decision-making levels, our executive levels, like Raquel and April have talked about at that institutional level, um, is represented of the people of that these decisions are made for. That everybody, I, I can't speak on behalf of what someone else may feel or think. So even from this presentation today, you're going to go back to your colleagues or your friends or your family and say, oh, I went over lunch and I had this discussion on with this panel today. And this is what I learned. But hearing it from the horse's mouth and having it translated are two different things. So if we want actual meaningful representation at those decision making um, spaces, we need to have the represent like the people who are you know, representative of those spaces. I don't know if April or Raquel, if you guys have anything to add to that. Uh, yeah, I, Ashley, I agree with you um, 100%. Um, I think that we can create diversity itself by hiring underrepresented groups. Um, however, I don't think there can be true equity and inclusion without um, Without like a found, without a foundation and understanding of anti anti racism, um, the fact that our our all of our systems are built on these principles um, of that are racist, um, I don't think that you know if we hire people who are representative of different groups within to these systems that are racist, uh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. To, to do the work that needs to be done. So um, I, I really, and, and again, I just like to emphasize that I am also, um, one thing I think that I need to say is that just, just because I'm a person of color does not mean I understand anti-racist theory or does not mean, and I think Ashley, you, you said that, and, and Raquel, you, you both said that too. 
Um, you know, it doesn't mean I understand that. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean that I have all that knowledge, but I am learning. And I'm beginning to see that, you know, without that under that sort of anti-racist understanding of, the, of our systems, and then and then the changes in policies that way, that allows for the work and supports the work to be done. So I think when you say, what does diversity, inclusivity and equity mean to you? Um, that's, that's what it means to me, that we need that foundation, that understanding before it can be true equity and, and inclusion. Yeah, no, I, um, I have to agree uh, with Ashley and April. I mean, we need to stop communicating like there's one way. I mean, you gotta ask yourself, are black, indigenous, peoples of color going anywhere? No, we're not. Um, like, so we need a, a variety of social and cultural characteristics um, in organizations because we are, we, because that's community. And, you know, we need to ensure everybody has access to, to the same treatment and opportunities and advancement, you know? Um, you know we, we need to start putting, put theory to practice. So. Awesome, thanks ladies. That's been, I, I agree with Feline that first kickoff was very moving for me and I took some notes and you guys touched on some of them in the last point here that I kind of wanted to resurface. Um, Raquel, you mentioned you wear two hats. Um, as you know, I do too. We're moms and we're policy professionals. And for me, that laying the groundwork of setting the frame, pushing the envelope as policy professionals to put this groundwork, that's one piece of it. The other piece is teaching the little people that are learning in our um, ears and arms length from us to see people, not colors. And we talk about it in our house, like blue, purple, black, green, it doesn't matter what color you see, what matters is what's on the inside. And I really liked what you said there, Raquel, that hit home for me. Um, especially having blonde haired, blue eyed Métis children. Nobody would see that. And so for them, I think of that's not a visual piece. You don't see that um, ancestry on the outside for them. So people wouldn't know that just simply by seeing them. So I really liked what you had to say there and wanted to capitalize on it. Um, Ashley, second question headed to you. Why is it important to have a diverse public service workforce? I think, I think that's a similar, a similar answer that if we're going to be making decisions that are going to be impactful, intentional and meaningful for the future, I can't make a decision with my perspective and purview if I haven't walked in those shoes. So an example with April talking about, you know, hey, there's barriers for people in certain communities, barrier to um, having, you know, the vaccine. So what can we do at this, at this space to, to support those people? identifying that that's an issue is not something that a lot of people would even consider. They have cars, they have internet access, they have phones. So if that is your world and you have the full accessibility, you're not going to probably think about, no, maybe, wow, there's a, a, mar- a large group of people that don't. And so again, like speaking on behalf of a group of people, um, I, it's just, I think it's false. You, you know, we have, like, I, I can't be that person. I can't be the voice of every, you know, person of color, right? But making sure, like April said, having those people at the table at those decision-making um, spaces, that's where we're going to, that's why it's important. But I also wanted to circle back to the one thing about um, about being a mother and working in the public sector too. I would just say, and again, this is why the panel is so beautiful because we all can have different perspectives. I do want my kids to recognize that there are differences, but they're beautiful differences. That you may you may be wearing a face covering, you may not. You may be of this this ethnicity. You may pray that this often, you know, amount of times a day. But to ask questions, have the conversation, you know, like get to know, explore that the diversity of the differences, you know, of you know, being a blonde hair, blue eyed compared. You know what I mean? Like let's explore that. And that's where I, with my kids, it's just like you can recognize, like you don't treat people. Everyone is treated equally, but you can recognize differences but celebrate them. But that's two two parts to that. I apologize. I kind went off and that's why I need speaking notes with me at all times so I don't go off on a tangent but um to the first part of your question again I can't speak on behalf of anybody else for those decisions you know that are so I guess an example is accessibility 
I, I wouldn't be giving advice to how to make sure that a building is accessible when I'm not, I'm not in that space. I don't have any right to make a suggestion of how to make sure a building is accessible to somebody, you know, when that's not, that's not the shoes that I walk in. So just a comment uh, there, but all over the map. Sorry about that. <laughs> No, no, thank you very much. And I actually want to pick up on uh, Raquel, if it's all right, I'll throw this uh, question to you. And this is from, uh, we're getting a lot of questions from the audience. Thank you so much for that. Please keep them coming. Uh, but just sort of to, to build off Tanessa and Ashley's points there about uh, about about children and the next generation. Uh, one of the, the audience members asked, how can we teach our children about diversity, equity and inclusion? So Raquel, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so one one thing that I've always, well, that I do with my own daughter, um, the, the own, my own, the youth in the community, is I'm honest with my conversations, and I share from experience, you know, and I share, you know, everything that we do that there's like within a story, um, there's always a lesson you know, like, and that's, that's just an Indigenous uh, perspective here that we, we share by stories and we always want them to capture the lesson and maybe one or more, you know, but as long as they're taking, taking that lesson away um, and that's the important thing. And so that's what I do is I, I story tell um, with my daughter and with youth um, to try to, to not, I want them to to make those decisions on their own as well. So I'm not trying to control on how how they um, uh, want to to how they see themselves or anything. But I want I want them to understand. You know, they've also they're also living in a different era than what I was what I've been exposed to and and what's going on. And I support it and I continually want them to see that. I, but I also want them to understand a little bit of the history. I want them to understand, you know, what it's just like um, uh, with the with the residential schools, you know, like although my grand, great grandparents attended residential schools, and my par own parents didn't um, didn't attend the residential schools, but went to day schools, and then I didn't experience a residential school, but it's impacted it's impacted us differently, you know, and although understanding the history of it, you you get to learn that the way that it may have impacted my great grandparents, it doesn't necessarily impact me that way, but there is an impact. And I think that's important for them to understand, you know, what's, what, what was, what occurred with the previous generation and how is it changing and, you know, and how do they continually change it and make it better, so. Awesome, thanks Raquel. Uh, Laleen, did you wanna pose another question from the audience or do you want me to continue? How about you go with one of the prepared questions and then I'll go back to the audience questions. Thank you. Sounds good, thanks everyone. Um, so April, I'm gonna turn the, uh, the question over to you. How do you think that governments can support equitable, inclusive and diverse teams? I know you've spoke of this a little bit, but um, there's more that you would wanna add. Sure. Um, th thank you, Tanessa. Um, I think, well, first of all, uh, let's make sure that we do have diverse teams. Um, I, you know, they're not necessarily that common in all organizations. Um, I think, um, I think, you know, oftentimes I walk into rooms and not just at work, but in, in public spaces as well. And I, I think a lot of people of color and indigenous people have experienced this, but you walk into a room, whether it's a theater or, and you look around and you are literally the only person of color in that room. And I'm not like, it, this is not unusual, it's not uncommon. And, you know, I wonder sometimes, um, I don't like I don't know how often other people think that or are aware of that. And and then also, like, what does that mean? So if I walk into a boardroom and there's only, you know, there's 10 people and I'm the only person of color, you know, how does that affect a person? 
in, in terms of their voice, in terms of who's listening, um, and in terms of also for some people, you know, how, how does that change? How does that change the way someone thinks or how do they have to change to, to sort of fit in there? Um, and, you know, in a lot of cases, and I say this to a lot of people that, um, that, that I, that I work with in community that it's so much easier for me, of course, because I was born here, I was educated here. I speak like them, I walk like them. And, um, you know, and, and that's not a criticism, but it's, it is, you know, it is the way it has been. And I don't have an accent. Um, I don't have, uh, you know, I, I think um, it's, it's really important that sort of, you know, we try to become a little bit more aware of that and then how that affects people, whether, whether it's in public space or whether it's in our, in our workspaces. Um, I, I just, it's, it's something I wonder sometimes how many people, I mean, my husband does all the time. He's, he's not a person of color, but he's very used to going into places now and going, oh yeah, you're the only person of color in this room. He, he recognizes it very clearly. So, uh, that, you know, that's just something, something small I wanted to share. Well, thank you, April. I have, uh, I'm going to throw this next, uh, it's actually a, a set of questions to Ashley. They all interconnect and you can pick up whatever part you want of it, Ashley. So these are three different questions uh, from, from three different audience members that, that really speak about, uh, about workplace issues. Um, so the first is, uh, in what ways uh, do people of color avoid being, quote, part of the tokenized tokenization agenda, unquote, end quote, in EDI efforts. How do you challenge being included uh, to the event slash meeting slash at the table, yet not offered a voice at the table, not listened to, not valued? What are ways to go about championing this and holding people in a power accountable for such actions? Uh, the second one, it's, uh, it's in a similar vein. Um, any thoughts on how we take our unique cultural connections and lives into a work culture that does not understand or opposes these cultural identities? How do we change stringent workplace or education values when they are opposed, imposed upon us in order to get an education and a job? And then the last one, um, which I think kind of ties those two together is, how do we address the burnout, stress, and trauma that BIPOCs working in EDI slash doing EDI work sometimes experience for various reasons? What supports and self-care are needed uh, for BIPOCs in EDI? So that was a whole bunch I just threw at you, Ashley. But I think that the larger question that's, that's coming out is, is how do you navigate uh, these workspaces and, and how do you create change protecting yourself? Um, how do you, how do you make it all work? What, and, and what I'm really hearing from a lot of these questions are, are people asking for advice um, in terms of, of how to make this work for themselves personally, as well as, as well as thinking broadly. So uh, Ashley, I'll throw it to you. But um, if, uh, if April and Raquel have thoughts on these, I'd, I'd very much welcome to hear those as well. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to hear April and Raquel too, because those are, I think those are, those are brilliant questions. I think, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to be super honest that some, no, not sometimes, a lot of the time, it actually feels like it's chaos. It actually feels like there's a lot going on and that you're not making an impact, um, you know, and that you're not taking care of yourself. But I think that uh, I just, I feel first you can't, you if to be the best version of yourself. You have to take care of yourself. And I'm going through a lot of things personally right now because of COVID that made me focus, hyper focus on that and recognizing that myself is the foundation. If I'm not happy being authentic, speaking authentically, being myself, then I'm not going to be able to be, you know, you know, I'm not going to be able to be passionate professionally either. So I think that that honesty with yourself is definitely step number one for my self-care. But I think um, making sure like what the comment about making sure that you're included in those individual meetings. I know that Raquel has an, a really good example of this too, but I think, unfortunately, I have the benefit of being an extrovert. Um, and so I, I really can, you know, I don't want to, I can speak when I am asked to speak. And, you know, I've 
I think it's a lot about relationships too. I've aligned myself with a lot of really good people and getting in that ear saying, Hey, like if you want me at this meeting, or if we want to talk about this, or if you're too, if you know, if you're not comfortable bringing this up, like, let me support you. I think that having that support and, you know, getting those alliances with, um, with your coworkers is very helpful, especially speaking to that executive level. And the thing is, I think there was another uh, comment about making sure that, um, that you know executive is taking it seriously as public servants as all these institutions that we work for and i noted that we do have checklists we do have um you know the targets that we need to to meet so that can be that platform this is an objective making sure that we have diverse representation training opportunities you know information sessions about you know, how we can become more diverse. Like this isn't something that is a, maybe we should, or maybe we shouldn't. So it's just maybe promoting the benefits of aligning with those, pol- well, I, I know this is about policy, but aligning with those policies, like this is what we're going to get out of it. Um, I don't think I answered all of those questions. The education one is unique. I, can, or whoever, I guess you want, I know you want to probably control it, like, but I'm just curious about where uh, the, the education question um, where, what lens that was in and specifically I want to address it. So I, if you said the unique culture does not understand education values, I just, I'm curious what you mean, what people or what that person means by that. Um, I'm not sure, but I can, I can reread it if that's helpful, Ashley. Uh, they, they wrote, um, that, uh, how do we change, uh, stringent workplace slash education values when they are imposed upon us in order to get an education and a job? I think that experience education, um, those they're important. Like th- we need to be able to have those things to have to be, you know, to do our jobs. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I totally understand um, the question because I think from my experience, I've had a lot of really good opportunities provided from me because of experience and not necessarily formal education. But then I've also seen some of my colleagues and cohorts also advance because of their education. Just like Raquel said, I got my master's and then I was let into the, you know, I was let in at that table. So I think, I don't think I'm hitting the mark on that question, but I don't know if Raquel or April, you guys can add in, maybe I'm not uh, understanding it. No. Maybe, maybe, maybe that person, um, we can even, if you want to send me an email and we can even have a coffee and discuss further. Cause I'm, I'm interested in that because that's an interesting question and I'd like to address it. And I apologize. I'm not missing the mark or I'm missing the mark here. So. Yeah, no, actually, I think it, it's also really important. I mean, I used to work at a, um, post-secondary education, uh, institution and, you know, um, getting like for, for, for receiving an education, that's, that's something that we do to advance in, in, in more of a Western worldview type of, um, it's, all, it's all Westernized. So, but if you are not, I say, I would say stay, stay true to yourself and your own guiding principles. Cause if you, when you are an empathetic leader, if you are an empowering leader, I mean, that's where you're really, truly going to advance. And I think that is the most important um, takeaway um, with your values is that continually learn and grow. And, you know, it's dealt with, even with your self-care, you know, reflect every day. We, I reflect every day and everything that I encounter to be like, how do I, you know, self-improve? How do I become accountable to my own actions throughout that day, you know? And I think that is really most important. I mean, the education at the end of the day is not going to, is not going to relate to you to the community. It's not going to bring that experience. You know, it's, um, it's who you are as a person that's really going to advance your leadership, I think. And, um, and that's where you're going to see value and people are going to be drawn to you as well. Yeah, you summarize that way, way, that was a lot more beautiful than what I was trying to say. Basically relationships, like you have to really connect with people at that human level. And I think that the more honest and authentic and being a human and admitting your mistakes and taking all those, pursuing all those um, training opportunities that you can informal and not um, formal um, is going to, is going to, to get you to that level of whatever that level that, uh, that means to you. So thank you, Raquel. That was a nice, that was a nice touch. Uh, thank you both. I'm, oh, sorry. Was, add, yeah, please go, go ahead. 
So just to add, um, Ashley did mention I had a, a good experience for being tokenized. Um, I do, I do want to share. I think um, it's really important that you know I am treat I am treated that way, especially I'll be asked to. Well, we're going to do some indigenous engagement. How would you approach it? You know, but I don't get to be invited. I just get to be there. You know, in the background, I don't have a voice, and so my voice is actually to tell you know my senior management how to do it. <laughs> and um, but. I think it's really important to be like, if you, if you want it done right, you have to speak. You have to, you have to inform of what, how to do it, you know, put it, put the, put the, put it in practice. Like, I mean, you need to get something to be like, well, you know, if you're going to come to me for advice, I mean, this is something we have to address for the whole entire agency, the department. And I think we need to put it together to be like, because we're always um, trying to figure out, you know, how do we approach this part? How do we approach this? And how do we do this? And I was just like, well, let's develop it. Let's define it. Let's let's just figure out, you know, let's work with our um, our First Nations and, and define, you know, how, how do we, we, we approach this type of um, uh, uh, policy, you know, this type of engagement? How would you want to see done in this region and stuff? So um, I think it's, it's just really important to be, to, to just share where you come from and to to stand up for yourself and be able to, you know, voice that you do deserve to be at that table. I think if there's one discussion that we we're having about just just with COVID pandemic, and I don't think I was invited. I was invited to the meeting. I think just by uh, by accident. I would say by accident. <laughs> and listening to everybody talk about, you know, why is there so much fear with this pandemic? Why is everything shutting down? And I'm like in the communities, and I'm like, well is multi-generation uh, families in one home. Like, you know, like, I mean, how do you control that? And I was like, and it was something that they never saw and didn't understand. And it's like, and so that's why it's important to have diversity at those tables and to have somebody with the experience and um, to share that voice and be able to, you know, uh, just just to bring bring that to the table so that you can be able to understand and relate to who, who you're working with. I wonder, can I just oh, make a comment yeah. as well? Thank Please. you. Thank you. So um, I think the uh, the questions that were connected to, you know, um, uh, how do you survive? How do you stay working? How do you keep the energy up when it's such a, um, for, for Black, Indigenous and people of colour in the workplace? Um, <clears throat> pardon me, we talk about this a lot. Uh, amongst amongst friends that I have um, in at work and over the years as well, um, I, I think probably anybody from Black, Indigenous, and people of color from and um, LGBTQ2S um, have all experienced this in the workplace. And when we're working in equity, diversity, and inclusion, we're working about things that are about us. Um, and we're being asked to move things forward that we are emotionally close to at the same time as we are pushing back on forces that are sometimes working against us. So, you know, there are, I think there are a lot of um, pieces to it. Um, I can't say enough for the team I work with at the city. I have such an incredibly supportive team. Um, and I tell people this and they can't believe it, but my whole team is Indigenous um, and I am the only non-Indigenous person on my team. Well, sorry, not the only, but um, one of just, I think two of us. Uh, but, you know, when I work with people with lived experience, when I hear stories daily about what that lived experience is in many ways, both positive and negative, the strengths that people bring, um, I, I can't tell you how much I've learned um, just in the last couple of years being a part of the team I'm on right now and what that brings to my work and my ability to, um, to, to continue on. So I always say to people, you know, you need to really, really um, embrace those small wins, those really small, you know, sometimes they're very small. Um, sometimes they're just, you know, um, oh, yay, we got that. Um, what we, I can't even think of a small thing, but 
you know, there are, there are always these small wins and we need to embrace those things, but it's, it's an accumulation of a lot of those small wins that lead to the bigger ones. And um, like for places such as the city of Saskatoon, we know like they are bureaucracies and they are meant to, you know, try to be everything to everybody. And it's very difficult to do that. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's a very large ship and it changes very, very, very slowly. So we, you know, if we're working in those situations, and I remember one time at the, when I was at the federal level, I, I was complaining to somebody and he's incredibly knowledgeable in the area of anti-racism. And, and I said to him, I go, oh my God, I have this manager that's just crazy and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and he just, he was just listening. He didn't say anything. And I was just ranting and he just stopped and he looked at me, he goes, April, get out. It's not worth it. It's not worth that fight. Or if it's worth that fight, then you really need to learn how, how, to, how, to, how to work with it. Um, so, you know, I learned from that very early on that you really need to pick your battles. You really need to pick the hills, you know, that they're going to come at you. And right now with so much happening, we have, um, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, Idle No More. We have anti-Asian hate. All of these things that are sort of coming together puts even more pressure on us to perform and to do the right thing and to support and to help and to teach and to, you know, so you really need to pick pick those hills that you're going to die on because they're very, and, and make sure that, the, you know, the right ones for you and your values and yours and what you believe in. Thank you. So I've got a, a number of audience questions that I'm going to group together again, because it's, it's nice to see some similar threads. Uh, so the first one is, uh, thank you so much for this event and thanks to our speakers. I would like to know from our speakers if they think the dynamic of racism takes a different toll on women than it is for men of the same ethnic group. If yet, what are the different dynamics and how might we as women navigate this? The second one, I'm just scrolling down here, uh, reads, uh, I am sorry if I offend anyone with this. There appears to be roughly 20 to 30 males in this session, so we have a lot of women attendees. How do BIPOC women tell whether they are being discriminated against based on either race, sex, or both? So there's a sort of a two questions really dealing with, with intersectionality there. Would anyone like to, to start with a response to that? I think acknowledging that that's that this is probably this this is probably the truth that there are you know barriers a for women as we all know and I, this isn't I'm not and I don't want to offend any male that's on, on the line at all because I appreciate that again the diversity and the representation of all participants you know um, to move the needle on where we want to go is necessary but I would definitely say that I think we all we all recognize that a lot of our senior leadership a lot of our senior politicians a lot of you know our executive teams are predominantly male ca predominantly Caucasian male so so recognizing that and uh, is is a hard part saying it out loud is a hard part is, is hard too but I would say that um kind of continually with like April said with these gradual steps of applying for opportunities being present and just trying and communicating with as many people relationship building and demonstrating your worth who you are um that you know you and I don't want to say that people so people because people will automatically have a judgment. I come into a meeting sometimes I, and I absolutely know maybe I am the own, only brown face on the screen. And I love to blow the ceiling on maybe any perception that you may have that I may not have um, an informed um, response or you know place at this table. I love to break those barriers. And so for me, I just try to be as strong as possible in every setting and make sure that there are any preconceived notions that you may have had about me, I'm going to dispel them. I will also note though, for sure, I have imposter syndrome. I'm in this acting position right now. It's a beautiful, wonderful opportunity that I've been given. The first thought that I had when I got it, knowing who some of my competitors were, you know, that were my other, you know, uh, challenge, like the other people that were um, on the competition with me, 
I was like, the only reason I got it was because I'm a female and I'm, you know, a woman of color. And so it's like in my head all the time. So trying to not only convince, not convince, but convey in a group setting that, no, I am here because I have a voice. I am here because I have a brain in here and I have a, you know, things to contribute to this project or setting. Um, but I also got to work on continuing, uh, convincing my or conveying that to myself too but recognizing that that is the case it's the visible rep, um, visible minority and fe- like females in leadership capacities is at is not a is not something that you see often it's the truth the difficult truth but it's the truth yeah, go ahead. for sure um and just something i'd like to add is is that I think absolutely it exists. Absolutely, it's a challenge intersection. Okay, so intersectionality, again, about learning and about, you know, myself and my own learning. A couple of years ago, I didn't even know the word intersectionality. I honestly, I'm learning these things as I go. And um, I I have great teachers. And I think that's part of it is, um, you know, as a woman, I have incredibly strong mentors. I have strong uh, people, women that I surround myself with, that I spend time with. Um, of course, my mother was my my strongest mentor and role model, um, and she always walks beside me. Um, so, uh, you know, I think whether it's in, again, whether it's in the workplace or in your life, um, we need to be strong for each other and have each other's backs. And another reason why I so appreciated being a part of this panel, I had never met Ashley and Raquel before. And, you know, to talk to them and learn about, um, you know, their expertise and their, it adds to, to, you know, to my network of really strong sort of uh, role models, uh, women in, in my life. So, uh, yeah, I, I just, I can't say enough. For, for making sure you have those, that will tell you you are strong and that you are not an imposter and that you are equally, if not better than that, that other, that, that person, that man, that whoever is, is in that position, so. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree with Ashley and April. I mean, um, it, it's something you do recognize. But one thing I have recognized coming to the public service is that uh, the women that are older, older than I am, and that have been there for for fifteen years. I mean, they I've noticed that they've been hesitating and they they don't speak up. And I think that something that I've encouraged them to change. Um, you know, they need to be resilient and be out, outspoken. I mean, times are changing, I think. And I was talking with one of my elders about this and they said that, well, they've grown into a different time, right? I mean, you can tell, you know, there's a time that they, what they've been exposed to, to what you've been exposed to. And, you know, it's time to actually bring up that leadership and, you know, and we're, and we're celebrating that. And we have so many female, female chiefs out in the communities now, which is, which is great to be seen. And, you know, I think it's, they set the example to be like, we, we are leaders, we, they're great role models out there. And I think we just got to continue empowering one another, you know. That's amazing. I love that. And I so couldn't agree more that I think all three of you guys are unbelievable role models and are definitely setting that tone and making the change. You're not just saying the words, you're sitting at the table and saying them. And I love it. Um, we've got a number of questions on a really similar, um, um, I guess, capture. So uh, Raquel, since you're, you're already on my screen, I'll maybe ask you to lead off with the answer to it here. But uh, the question is how um, white colleagues or folks, colleagues um, who aren't visibly represented by color can be allies in the workplace to colleagues who are visibly um, of color. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, uh, I mean, nobody, nobody likes to talk about it. Um, you know, we need to, to push for these conversations and we need, we need leaders that are not people of color to be able to support us as well. You know, I mean, it's, this is tough. This is tough for us. I mean, this was also tough for me to be speaking. I'm here 
today and I'm like, and sharing my story. I mean, I got emotional a few times. I mean, um, because we're, we're all responsible in this. And, you know, when you give ownership to one group, um, you know, everybody starts to shrug it off and say the responsibility is not my problem. Right. And we don't, we don't need that. You know, we need, uh, we need the support. We need to be able to create that space. We need the leaders there to be able to help us create that space, you know, hold space for those conversations. Um, and we need to start taking some action to be like for, for what's being heard and, you know, and changing the organizational culture and, um, you know, it's just like, like reconciliation. I mean, if you're not uncomfortable, then you're not doing it right. So, I mean, I think we start, we start, we need to start to get a, a little bit uncomfortable, get ourselves in that place, start opening up. I mean, it's going to be difficult at first to talk about it, but I'm happy to be here to talk, to talk about it. I mean, don't, can't imagine how emotional I got before starting this conversation, but as sport with Ashley in April, like I really appreciate that and having those earlier conversations and to feel really comfortable in this space, right? I mean, it's it's a lot. And I think that um, uh, like it's just having those leader, having somebody come forward, having somebody to support you, I mean, and what you're trying to do, even if it's small or big, I mean, that makes a big difference to us. You know, it does, it, it's really impactful. It's meaningful. I mean, like it's, we're, we're very grateful, you know, when that, when that happens. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's what I have to say. I don't know if Ashley and April want to add. No, I think that's, I think that was, that's exactly it is making sure that there's advocation all the way across. But I think I have so many, you know, Caucasian family and friends and that, that are, that, that are supportive. I would say to be able to have the confidence um, to challenge a conversation or to speak up, like I said, for injustice or to not just ha 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 laugh off of a laugh off of a joke regardless if there's nobody of no people of color in the room be that person regardless of you know what ethnicity that you are that says this is not okay for me i'm not going to tolerate and i'm not going to stand for this type of conversation communication jokes um uh, injustice etc regardless if if it's if it's a room full of you know all caucasian people which is difficult i recognize going against the grain i have done it myself i have sat silent multiple times early on in my career when things were not okay because as april says you want to walk and talk like the group Okay. So I get that it's difficult, but if that is where we want to go and we, we want to say, Hey, like, I want to show that I'm supporting and I'm, you know, I'm advocating and that I'm not in alignment with any oppression. I would just say, be as vocal as you are comfortable. Cause not everybody is comfortable to be honest, you know, when something is not right to speak up when uh, it's not, when it's not right. That would be my comment. Um, yeah. I just like to add that. Um... I, I mean, I think Raquel and Ashley and I are all on the same page on so many things, of course. Um, I just like to add that I think if, you know, to be, and I, I thought a lot about this lately, um, both, you know, working in the community and within a large organization, um, something that I think, think we need more of is just people, people really listening, you know, really listening to the voices and helping and and informing decisions with those voices. Because we don't have enough people right now yet in a lot of organizations in, in decision-making levels and at you know, senior levels, um, we need to ensure that our teams are diverse, but we also need to make sure we listen to the voices and let those voices inform decision-making. Um, until we're at a place where we have enough representation um, at, at some of those at some of those levels. Um, and also I find and I find myself in this situation. I know I can't speak on behalf of indigenous people, but I certainly can speak up and have a voice. And you know many times I'm at a table where I'm the only person of color, there are no indigenous people there and people start talking about indigenous issues. And I, I just put my hand up and go, so why are, why is there nobody here from the Indigenous community? You know, we just need to be able to put our hand up and ask that question and, and, and bring that to people's attention and say, you know what, we need to invite them to, we need to invite people to this, this table. Or if you're talking about Black Lives Matter and there are no Black people at the table, it, sh you know, it should be obvious to us by now that, well, 
they need to be at the table. So be that voice, be that voice to stop the conversation and say, let's wait, let's invite more people to this table and allow people to have, allow people, black, indigenous people of color to have the voice and also to listen and inform the decisions and act upon that. Not just to invite, speak, and then ignore. Well, thank you. And those those were wonderfully concrete examples of what individuals can can do. I've uh, I'm going to group together a number of questions and actually um, talk. I'll, I'll use one question that I think captures a number of other people's questions. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. I apologize that I'm having to to squeeze these together, but uh, there's so much so much uh, discussion going on. It's uh, it's wonderful to see. But I think this one captures uh, what a number of you were asking. Uh, each speaker has described an aspiration that's bigger than representative workspaces. The benefits of diversity come from representative voices in our workspaces. Have you experienced a work environment that was particularly welcoming and safe for diverse voices and voices of dissent? What did the manager or team do to create that environment? So there's sort of a question of how do we create, a, not just as individuals, but as a team and as a culture, how do we create this kind of space? I, can I start that one, Lillian? Great. Um, um, I, like I said to, to you earlier, um, I am in a work team right now that is majority Indigenous. Um, I am the only Asian person on the team. Um, I, in my, so I, I'm, I'm going to use that as a microcosm because I think it's a great um, example of, of, of how, how our workspaces should look and should be. Um, I, I feel 100% myself in that workspace. When we are on team calls, I feel 100% myself. I'm, I feel very safe. Um, I can rant, I can complain, I can um, look for advice, I could look for direction. It's one of the very few times in my life um, that I've ever had a team like this. I have a direct supervisor who is more like a mentor than, uh, than a supervisor or, or uh, manager. She, um, she's half my age for God's sakes. But uh, I, I think that's what really is actually, I, I value that, you know, she, she's taught me so much. Um, so I, I think if we, you know, if we look at that on a larger scale, then that's also what our organizations need to look like, right? We need people with lived experience talking to us every day as, you know, as, as colleagues do. And um, I, I think like right now, like I said, I, I couldn't be more grateful for the team, the immediate team that I'm working with. However, we're within a structure, you know, that does not look like that right now. So, you know, there's always that hope that I feel so safe in that environment that at some point in the future and maybe not in my lifetime, but it will look more like that. If I can piggyback off um, from a perspective of uh, leading teams, I, I would just say I think that it's the responsibility of the leadership to make sure that the incumbent that, that is coming into the group, what is comfortable for them and having that one on one conversation with asking questions. I feel like we, we can't assume we can't assume that because um, you're of this ethnicity, then this is going to be how you want to be, you know, shared or, you know, I feel like ask questions people want those questions asked um, of them, like, what are you comfortable with? What, you know, are there considerations that we need to make to ensure that you can practice your faith? Are there considerations that we can make to ensure that you feel safe at work? Um, and, and I just think having having those questions and being knowing as leadership, what, the, what that foundation is of that comfortability of that specific person, then you embody that with your team. You continue you to embody that with your, like you lay the foundation for the, how the rest of your team is going to interact and welcome that individual. And I would make it purposeful and intentional. So not just like, oh, like maybe this person will walk themselves around the office and introduce people and, you know, no, let's make it like, what, what do we think is going to be an appropriate way to welcome this person into the group? And then also, you know, to share some of those boundaries that they may want to share with the rest of the team. And so 
it's a, not a one size fits all. It's just like leadership. You're not going to motivate or communicate um, with everybody the exact same. So I would work with that specific individual. What are their needs uh, from the team? And then, you know, making sure that it creating a safe space to share those needs with the rest of the group and, and leading by example. That would be my, that's an example, I think, of making sure that people feel, feel safe and welcomed and inclusive. Um, to, and uh, like April said, the ability to be themselves at work. Yeah, no, I have to agree with um, Ashley and April. I'm like, leaders are responsible to make this change. I mean, it's uh, very difficult when you're in a enforcement agency or been oppressed by the Indian Act. But I mean, um, I mean, we, we need to do fix the international in, institutional complexity of um, the racism and cultural competency um awareness uh training just maybe a start but i mean you know being able to be an employee having a manager to be able to have those conversations to be able to express i mean like what what kind of uh, environment i'm observing and be able to be like how do we move forward you know bringing those ideas forward i'm like and you know try to just share to be like, how can we, you know, change the change the uh, organizational culture here, and you know, and um, you know, having them to be able to see what it feels like to be like to be an outsider and to be able to listen and be able to like, you know, provide those ideas and how how that they can change, you know, be able to just take the recommendations and how we can change the leadership and you know, if they and hopefully they put it to action. I mean, I've I have a, a a good director to be able to express that type of uh, concerns, you know, and bring that to the table and be like, and and share, you know, how we can change that and be able to be a voice also for the employees. I mean, coming in, um, coming in, I noticed like, you know, things, things were not great, I would say. Things were not great, but because of who I am, a lot of people opened up to be able to, to look to me to be able to change that. And, you know, and to be able to have somebody have a, a senior manager in place to be able to that's going to listen to me and to be able to listen to everybody and I can be that voice for everybody. I mean, it's improved things and it's made things better. And um, and I think that's what we really need. You know, the leaders are, are the ones responsible to make this change. So. Wonderful. Well, I'm before I turn things over, I'm mindful of time, and I'm before I turn things over to Tanessa to to make some final comments. I I just wanted to first of all just read a few words of thanks uh, that uh, that I'm hearing uh, from uh, from the from the participants and um, and actually we just got one that uh, just came in there uh, right now and it went to everyone, but I'll read it aloud. And Anyway, I have to leave for another meeting, but I want to thank Ashley, April, and Raquel for their fearless discussion of these issues. Honestly, I feel like I'm in a room full of virtual spark plugs, and I haven't felt this good in a long time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Another person wrote, I just want to thank the panelists for being so vulnerable and willing to help us understand. Thanks also to the organizers for putting this session together. Uh, and I'm just scrolling up because there were more. Uh, I think you guys get the spirit, though. Uh, I, there's so many messages that I'm uh, I'm struggling to see the last one. But I think uh, what uh, what I'm hearing, and then I'll turn it over to Tanessa. And what I'm reading is that uh, to to all three of you that that the people in the audience. Um, really are feeling like like you've opened up a very important discussion and your willingness to be so frank and so vulnerable is something I think that has has touched a lot of people deeply so so thank you very much for that and uh to the audience members the many many audience members whose questions I was not able to get to um thank you so much for for these thoughts it really really indicates that you are engaging deeply with uh with these discussions and you are really hearing and and taking to heart what is said so so I thank you very much for that Tanessa I'm going to turn it over to you awesome thanks Celine I also want to thank uh, today's speakers, April, Ashley, and Raquel. Uh, you guys were just fabulous. I, I can't even imagine how um, you, you really just came fearlessly and shared so deep and so passionately. And uh, it was amazing. Thank you so much. 
Um, I think you guys have helped under help people understand a little bit more why and how we can raise the bar on BIPOC voices uh, in the public sector. And I do want to thank our audience members as well for joining today. So if you enjoyed this lecture, please keep an eye eye on the GSGS events calendar and the IPAC Saskatchewan website where upcoming events are promoted. Uh, just a few uh, promoted promotions here to tail off the end on items that are upcoming. Wednesday, June 23rd, JSGS will be hosting the final EDI lecture of the spring featuring Dr. Gina Grandi and Dr. Lorelai Nichols speaking to diversity and leadership. So the details can be found on the JSGS events calendar shortly. And following the next day on Thursday, June 24th, IPAC Saskatchewan Regional Group will be hosting our annual AGM and it will be followed by a panel discussion on the policy, business and economic perspectives in the Saskatchewan craft beer industry. And will be followed by a digital patio networking event. Uh, so you can register that register for that one as well by emailing saskatchewan at ipac.ca. Uh, at IPAC, we also have our second book in the book club launch for the summer read, which is Creating a Public Value by Mark Moore. So stay tuned to hear who our feature leader is. Uh, the book club meeting will convene after summer, so you get to enjoy a patio read on that one. And lastly, our nominations for the Lieutenant Governor's Awards are open until June 30th. So I would invite folks to please reach out to me personally or see our IPAC Saskatchewan website for the nomination package. So please join me in turning on your audio and providing a round of applause for our speakers. Yay. Can virtually, hey, to make this real. Uh, I love that. That's human beings, connection, hands. I love that. Good work. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.